Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Erwin LaCour is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his first appearance on Boundless Body Radio on episode 220. Erwin LaCour is the founder of MoveNat, a synthesis of his long-term passion for real-world physical competency, his love of movement in nature, his extensive knowledge of physical education history, and his personal philosophy of life. In 2008, while living, training, and instructing in Brazil, he worked on synthesizing his knowledge, experience, methods, and principles into the creation of an entirely new training and coaching system. He defined an overall approach based on evolutionary natural tenets, which better fit the concerns and expectations of people today, and MoveNet was born. Erwin has been featured in Men's Health Magazine in an inspiring article about himself and MoveNat, written by the New York Times bestselling author Christopher McDougall, and has appeared on many interviews and presentations worldwide. Erwin's more recent interests have led him to become a world-renowned expert in proper breathing and breathwork to optimize health, performance, and recovery. You can find Erwin at www.movenat.com and at www.breathholdwork, all one word, dot com. Erwin LaCour, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Well, thank you, Casey. That was pretty thorough and uh I'm Erwin LaCour, and I approve this message. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Man, I was able to use some of the introduction that we used for last time, but you are a very, very busy person. I had to update a lot of that. So you gave me more work this time than last time to get your introduction done. <laughs> well, you did great. Very awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you. I've been, um, I, I know you, we mentioned that you spent time in Brazil. I actually lived in Brazil for two years. Um, and so I'm oh, nice. becoming, um, I'm, I'm still, flu- it's been 20 years, but I'm still fluent in Portuguese. And just a few weeks ago, I took on a new client who I'm now seeing three days a week and she doesn't speak any English. And so I have to do the whole thing in Portuguese. And I, I don't know if you speak Portuguese or not, but one thing about Brazil is they re- they have a lot of trouble with the W and maybe that's already rubbing off on me because I really stumbled over world. <laughs> It's true. Uh, I do remember uh, um, a, a bit of it, but, um, you know, I, I've learned uh, many languages, including uh, Mandarin, uh, German, Latin, um, obviously English. You know, if you are not there in the country to speak it every day, then it doesn't stick. Yeah. So, but, but the good thing is that once you learn, just like many things in life, once you've learned them, you may forget them, but it's dormant somewhere in your brain and you can get get it back quickly that's quicker a, than if you start from scratch for sure that's very true i've been experiencing that this time and it's an impressive list of different languages that you have been able to speak in your life those are all like completely different language systems really impressive man well you know uh english then latin and german uh, were they were mandatory to me <laughs> i was in school I uh, had really no interest whatsoever in latin even though it, it did uh it helps with other uh, with understanding uh, many languages that have Latin components better. All right, German had no interest. I'm sorry <laughs> to my German, yes, but I had no real personal uh, um, need for German. Um, and Mandarin, I learned it because I did work, uh, I did spend a total of two years in China in a different life, in a wow. past life. Yeah, wow. Then, and then Portuguese because I had to, well, also because I lived for some time in, in Brazil. Yeah. Wow. It must have been a past life because I've never heard about your uh, experience in China. You have lived a lot of different lives. And we're definitely going to spend a majority of our time today talking about your latest passions and breath work, which I think is so undervalued and underappreciated. Before we do, it's been quite a while since we've had you on. We were episode 220. We're now on episode like 520. So a lot of time has passed. If you don't mind, could you remind the listener your story and how you started MoveNat? Well, first off, uh, you are incredibly, um, incredibly uh, productive with your, so congratulations with your podcast. That's very amazing, very impressive. My story, uh, what, so what people know about, um, and obviously they don't know about my time in China or things that uh, I did in my life, but uh, yes, I, uh, in 2009 is when I officially brought the MoveNat method to the world. So MoveNat goes for movement in nature and moving naturally. And the idea was very simple. Um, a fitness program or a also a, a physical education curriculum based on the whole spectrum of what are our universally natural human movement skills. So instead of uh, 
training with exercise machines or based on exercises that are, you know, based on anatomy or physiology, we simply take our existing movement abilities, movement skills that we all have since we were kids. So walking, balancing, running, jumping, landing, of course, hanging, swinging, all these movements, moving things, throwing, catching things, carrying things. All those are movement abilities that we all develop, boys and girls, when we're kids, by instinct. And what the movement method is, it's, uh, well, first off, it's based on the practice of the full spectrum of those, those movement abilities. And second, it teaches you how to, through you know learning techniques, to become very efficient at those skills. So that's the movement method. This is what I'm known for since 2009. But I started to teach this before that. And obviously, I've been practicing this for even longer. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I noticed that you're being very choosy about how you say what MoveNet is. You've used the word skills. Um, it's a movement skill. That's different than saying it's exercise. Does traditional exercise, in your opinion, still have value? Like, like you mentioned going to the gym and using machines. Is that still valuable, but also different than the way we should be moving day to day? Oh, of course, of course, especially to people who are not physically active, who haven't been physically active for a long time. There are consequences to that, and they are not good consequences. Uh, it makes the body to become weaker, to become less and less functional, less and less capable, less and less healthy as well. And that's the truth. That's not a judgment. It's just a, a law of life, natural law of life. All right, so attending that most people today in this modern lifestyle suffer from that lack of physical activity, sometimes almost zero physical activity except for walking and you know, standing up and walking a few steps. Then for these individuals, any physical activity is going to work. Any physical activity is going to be amazing. Why? Because, well, uh, the difference between having a completely idle body and a body that starts to be physically active to you know build will build muscles will uh, generate good uh, hormones will uh, acquire better cardiovascular fitness etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. okay now that doesn't mean that anything goes i mean from our perspective here at movenat and from a biological perspective um let's take a, an example let's use a metaphor what would be the, the ideal way to train, to physically exercise a wild dolphin or an eagle or a wild horse or any wild animal, a bear, a, a lion, a deer, whatever that species is? It would probably feel absurd to want to have them go to a specific place with exercise machines um, to uh, isolate the muscles and then do some specific cardio or stretching exercises on the side, that would make no sense. And, and why is that? Because everybody knows that they are wild animals and therefore they don't need any of that. They just need to move the way their species designed them to move in the environment where they evolved as a species. And the question is, why should it be any different in us human beings? And that's the question we're asking. We already have a, a, the best, the most effective, the most natural exercise programs that's built in. And we know it because whenever we look at kids, they all do the same. And that's before they are getting any instruction. They do not need a specific place or a specific time. Babies and then young kids, they will crawl, they will roll on the back, they will stand and jump and land and balance and They'll do all these movements, regardless of the country where they are grown, uh, where they are, I mean, um, where they grow up, where they are raised. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what their parents are in terms of uh, ethnicity, social background, social status, uh, uh, whatever. It doesn't matter. So if the program is right there. And we all went through it because we all were little kids and we went through it. And then we probably were told, hey, uh, Oh, stop doing that. Why? Well, stop doing that because you're going to hurt yourself. 
Stop doing that because it's not the right time and it's not the right place. And it's never the right time and never the right place. All right, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but but pretty much there is a limitation that is uh, across all countries, all cultures. There's always a limitation on the type of movements that kids should do and when and where. Yeah. It's most of the time it's inappropriate to for children to move the way they instinctually move. So we want to reduce that movement. We want to we don't want to encourage it or to support it or to channel it. We don't want to trust that it's important, that's there for a reason. We want to look at it as if it was a problem more than an opportunity. So that is the idea that what was missing, what had been missing, even though it was there in history, in the, in the history of physical education, was a system in the modern world that would not only enable people, give people a permission to do what they were doing by instinct when they were kids, but actually to educate them. In doing this again and in doing this the most effectively, the most efficiently possible, that's the move that approach so we don't exercise just for the sake of exercising of course any form of exercise is somehow going to be beneficial however not any form of exercise is going to make you become capable in the real world mm. because that's what we're talking about it's not about what you're going to look like in the mirror even though you will get results in that regard as well yeah. but the priority of uh, the the mission the concern whatever we call that the goal is to make you able which is capable capable to operate your body in always tangible in always useful in always practical and effective in the real world what does that mean can you run can you jump we're talking about over obstacles we're talking about uh, through beyond over under obstacles we're talking about some of the movements that we may have to do in time of need, unexpected, and we're, we're not ready for for those because we've never simulated being, you know, confronting those uh, circumstances. And then we realize, oh, I'm not ready for it, neither physically or mentally. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to climb this. I don't know how to jump over there. Um, and if I try, I'm going to crash and hurt myself. Yeah. Et cetera, et cetera. So. It's a mindset. The mindset is a person who has the desire to ensure that their body and their mind are ready and capable to operate in the real world in any moment, in any place when needed. And that has nothing to do with the size of your biceps or you know the shape of your body. It's not related. It's not exactly the same. That's a really good point. I think you explained that super well. I do have one last question before we move on to breathwork. And I, I'm just going to point out, I think the pandemic showed us that we're not prepared as a species for any kind of weird times and weird disasters. So unfortunately, I don't think we've learned any lessons there. Um, but I do want to ask you about something that you mentioned, which is injury um, and injury prevention. This has gone so much higher up on my list of priorities when I'm working with my clients as my career has gone on. As we're teaching people to move more naturally, how, to, how do we ensure that people don't get hurt while they do it? Well, people get hurt already by not moving. People get hurt by being idle. The body deteriorates. And those health issues that we have, uh, people complain about their knees, about their joints, about their lower back, about their their breathing, about what whatever that is that is deficient, limited, restricted, or stiff and painful in their body. That is not at all the outcome of exercising. It's the outcome of not exercising. It's the outcome already of just the deterioration that takes place in a person's body when that body is inert most of the day. And people may think, well, my body is not inert. It, I move my body every day. Well, what do you do exactly? And I'm talking about most people in the modern lifestyle. If you look at what they do from morning to evening, from the moment they wake up to the moment they go back to bed, they wake up, they stand, stand up, 
they walk a few steps towards the next seat and eat something. They walk to the shower, take a shower, etc. Then they commute, they sit more, then they are working on a desk. They sit more or they have a job where they have to stand, so they stand more. So standing, sitting, standing, sitting. It's not even sitting in a diversity of natural ways. There are many ways to sit naturally on, on the floor. No, we're talking about the same way um, like that most people are sitting all day. I'm actually sitting in that that conventional way right now. Uh, but you're not. You're sitting in a, in a natural way, which is great. Um, so what do you expect from that? That's that's inertia. That's that's idleness. There's no no variety, no frequency of movement. No, not frequency of movement. No variety of movement. No intensity of movement. If you don't use it, you lose it. So that is. So when people start to implement movement, any movement, we're not just talking about natural movement. We're talking also about any sport. Any sport. Any physical activity entails that you are practicing movement, that you're doing movement, and you haven't done that for a very long time, for years, maybe for decades, or not in those ways, not with that frequency, not with that intensity, how do you think your body is going to respond? Your body is not ready. So you think, oh, well, I'm still young. Well, that's what you, you your mind thinks. That's what you assume. But the reality, the physiological reality of your body, including also your nervous system, because it's the brain that operates the body, um, you are deficient there. You, you're you deficient physiologically. Your body is not phys, uh, physiologically ready to do that again. And you're deficient neurologically. It means your brain has forgotten how to operate this body in a way that is safe. That's why people are themselves. And then they're going to blame exercise for getting hurt. They are not going to blame their idleness for all these years for, for hurting themselves the moment they, they, they move. That's the problem. It's a... It's it's a compl- it's a, a huge problem in perspective. The the perspective is completely off because when you were a kid, you were hurting yourself all the time without hurting yourself. Let me explain. You were hurting yourself because you were trying a lot of movements, successfully or not, a lot of time unsuccessfully because you're learning to move successfully, you're learning to move more efficiently. So you got it. Repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. That's why kids are always moving. It tells you about the importance of movement. It's definitely something that you naturally have an instinct for that pushes you when we're kids in those early stages of development to move that much every single day. And we hurt ourselves because we get bruised and we we, we fall and it hurts, but we don't get hurt. It does not require a surgery or a a rehab or except in extreme cases. But out of the incredible amount of movement of movement in those years, we're talking about years of childhood spent moving every single day, maybe not all day. Because kids go to school and they're prevented, prevented from doing that movement. But still, it's pretty much all day they were to be left alone. And what's the injury rate? It's close to zero. You rarely see a kid with a, a cast or a, need, you know, laser surgery on their on their tendons or anything like that. But it happens to adults. It happens to it happens to adults that have remained idle for decades. Then they start a sport, they want to be young, they want to be good, they want to punish themselves back into shape, and boom, and then get hurt. And then they don't point at those years or decades of idleness. They point right away at the physical activity. Physical activity is bad for you. Running is bad for your joints. (laughs) Hello? It's just like saying that, you know, if movement is bad for your joints, how about thinking is bad for the brain? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. Thinking poorly, thinking very negatively all day is going to color your brain, you know, is going to ingrain neural pathways that are conducive to 
reflexively be a negative person. So it's a misuse of your ability to think. Well, there's a disuse and a misuse, a lack of use of our bodies. And when we do use our bodies, then we we use them are in ways that are that can easily hurt ourselves. Mm. Okay, so that's that's the real um, perspective we should have that most people should have. Yeah. Wow, I love that. It's so very. It's well radically, it's brutally honest, but that's the truth. If you add to that, by the way, Casey, that uh, not only people are physically inactive, so they're not also ready for that frequency, that volume, that intensity, that diversity of movement, those those, those ranges of motion, the, the specific, specificity of those at first. But that's also not just because they don't move enough. That's also because they don't take care of their body. They feed their body bad with junk food. They are uh, sleep deprived. They are super stressed. All those are known to inflame the body, age the body, uh, reduce the immune system, etc. So even when they get hurt, it's they get hurt much worse than what they should. Um, you know, but than than if they were to be also not only physically active but also living a healthy lifestyle. So that's a lot to weigh in yeah. and to factor in. Yeah. No, I love that. You mentioned kind of a negative cyclone of things that all seem to go with each other. And, and to think that that could be flipped around and can be an upward spiral when people address their nutrition, they start moving a little bit more. They start to realize there's too much stress and, you know, really focus on sleep. All of those things tend to improve together as well. I mean, it's amazing for all the nutrition conferences I go to. I also see people disproportionately wearing barefoot shoes and all kinds of stuff. And so you pick up one of these habits and all of a sudden you've been able to, to get some of those others. So I think it's really well explained about the injury. Um, I want to talk about breathwork. This is fascinating to me. I know this is something you've been talking about a little bit more in the last few years. You, you have a world record, you have a new course all about it. Um, it <laughs> is that not true? It's not a world record. <laughs> I've heard this a few times, but I do not hold a world record. I wish I did, but uh, no, I use, I, I hold one of the um, U.S. national record for steady breath holding. I see. So holding your, holding your breath a very long time while doing nothing else but that. Yeah, gotcha. You don't move, you just hold your breath and you wait. Okay, gotcha. Well, anyway, <laughs> you can hold your breath for a very long time, not a world record. Um, pretty impressive stuff. I'm, I'm curious how that kind of got into your field of consciousness. Obviously, it's something that we do from the moment we're on this earth until the moment we leave is breathe, but n not many of us are very conscious of it. How did it enter your consciousness and then become something that you knew you needed to speak out about? Well, it's a fusion of many interests of mine. Uh, originally started to train breath holding. Well, everybody has tried that as a kid. I used to do that about 15 years ago, almost actually more than close to 20 years ago now, when I was training long distance triathlon, triathlon and long distance triathlon. Anyways, I was also adding some breath holding to that as an exploration. And it was really hard. I had no method. I had I didn't have the right approach, so I was doing it the way most people do. Like, oh, I hold your breath for the longest time possible, and it's a terrible feeling. And I didn't didn't know better. And uh, about four years ago now, um, so I was living in Mexico, and I, I love to spearfish. And in spearfishing, you need to hold your breath a long time, waiting for fish to be curious and come, you know, and get closer closer to your uh, to your spear. And um, I started to train on land, just so dry, as a compliment to to help me hold my breath better at the bottom of the sea. And I got really hooked up. And I also started to understand that it was not just physiological, that so much was involved from a mental and very quickly understand from a spiritual perspective as well, in fact, whatever you want to call that. Um, and it became a fascination to me and uh, I started to study how to how this works, how to make this work, including meditation, visualization, you know, mental preparation, all that, those aspects of the mind. So 
I dug into the science of physiology, but also of the you know psychology, time perception, uh, per, uh, time perception, self hypnosis, and things like that. You know, mm. um, and so through a lot of um, mindful practice, you know, taking a lot of notes, experimenting, I, I start to develop a method that I've been sharing for about two years now. Mm. So I do teach breath work. Um, which is a foundation, even though I do teach it different than most people teach it. And, but it's also a foundation to then transition to breath hole work, which is no breath work. You do not breathe. Yeah. Um, you completely pause any ventilation. And uh, that's what I teach. And yes, it does create a uh, altered states of mind but it's also something that um, does not just happen because you are holding your breath you're doing it you're making it happen to you because you want to hold your breath longer and that's the way to hold your breath longer just on a regular conscious mind it's very hard to sustain that type of challenge but if you can meditate yourself into an altered state of mind, then the physiological challenge can be overcome with more ease. And then you can prolong your breath holes much longer. Mm. And that's what I teach. Yeah. And it has benefits to the day-to-day -day life because it's about also mental clarity, relaxation of the mind, relaxation of the body, and emotional resiliency. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's start with the breath work itself. What... <laughs> What are some of the key components of doing breath work? We'll talk about breath holding here in a minute, but let, let's talk about breath work itself. Is there specific protocols you have to use? Is it um, terribly uncomfortable? How much work is there in breath work? Um, can you explain some of the key tenets of breath work itself? All right. So for me, uh, breath work is for the most part unnecessary. That is not something I need to do. And let me explain that. Um, Breath work is good for people who do not know how to breathe or have limitations with their breathing. We're talking about the ventilation side. We're talking about, for instance, they lack vital capacity or lung volume. They lack strength of their respiratory muscles. They lack awareness of their breath. So they breathe a lot, even intermittently through the mouth, which is detrimental during the day and at night as well. So there are a lot of people who suffer from those problems and often they are not aware of them. That is when breath work is very useful is to mindfully pay attention to one's ventilation, but also to mindfully alter it until it, it becomes different. Different, not just when you think about it. And that's the very important point. It becomes different reflexively. What that means is that your breathing is improved even when you are not thinking about it, which is most of the time, which is 99.99% of the time. There's a reason why we don't have to think about breathing to keep breathing. Our ventilation cannot stop, should not stop, except if we understand the value in making it happen sometimes like in breath or work there's a lot there are lots of benefits of doing that but otherwise you want your breathing to be taken care of for you like it always is better so what is eupnea what is the ideal normal standard way of breathing because we can't say well i breathe that way a person breathes completely different because we have different styles <laughs> doesn't make any sense because that's a fundamental physiology that has implications to very deep implications to health including physical health mental health emotional health so the ideal breathing pattern is a, a breathing that is nasal that is diaphragmatic through a diaphragm, not through the upper respiratory muscles, not through the mouth, not like that. Uh, and also that is slow, slow, as in five to eight 
breathing cycles per minute. That is the goal. That is what everybody should be breathing like when they think about it, and most importantly, when they do not think about it, when they are busy doing something else. So if you're going to do a lot of fancy breathwork exercises just to mix them up and just to so that you do some work, okay, why not? But first off, do does that take into account what a specific individual needs at a specific time? Because you don't just mess up with the way you breathe with your ventilation just because it's fancy and you know cool and trendy to do. There are implications for your nervous system. So some exercises can calm you, others can agitate you. What do you need? What do you want? Um, some people don't have the health required for specific breath work exercises. They are not ready at a nervous system or the physiological um, level, I mean, or of a, a level of their nervous system to, to do some of the intense breath work exercises. That should not be, for instance, I'm talking about hyperventilation. Four minutes at a time. They should not be doing that because there are already people who breathe through the mouth, people who breathe too fast, people who are chronically shifted in the sympathetic nervous system, which, which means they're in a constant state of agitation. Uh, so you're going to say, well, yeah, but it may help them revert back to you know more relaxation. Maybe if they're lucky, and maybe not. Maybe he can just aggravate their situation. So you see, uh, I'm not a supporter of what I call the you know rag bag breath work, or just mix things up, and everybody goes one size fits all exercises in one session, group sessions, and everybody does the same. And you have breathing exercises that agitate you, others that calm you down, then agitate you again, and it's like it, it's all over the place. What do we want? What we want, so then the second aspect is, is doing that helping individuals to establish a nasal, diaphragmatic, and slow, reflexive breathing pattern. That's the question. So for me, it's not about the specificity of the exercise. It's about the effectiveness. Breath work should be about the effectiveness of helping people establish that ideal eupnea, the ideal healthiest breathing pattern, which again is slow, nasal, diaphragmatic, doesn't matter which, which one is first. It, those are the three pillars of a strong, healthy breathing. Yeah, wow, that's great. All right, so, so why is it that I don't personally do breath work? It's because my breathing is already like that. So, why should I practice any breath work? I don't really need it because I've already a reflexive breathing pattern that is the way it ideally should be in everybody. And that's why I practice breath full work, which is the next level. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you're talking about hyperventilation, I think a lot of our listeners might be aware of a breathing technique out there that's been really popular over the course of last decade. Uh, care to comment on the usefulness of that? All right. So, so hyperventilation, a lot of people, in fact, when I um, meet new people and they, they, they ask me what I do and I talk about the teaching of meditation through breath, breath holding and things like that, and they talk about breath work. And very typically, the Wim Hof exercise is coming up and the idea of hyperventilation. So um, people assume that if I do breathing exercise or if I teach anything in that field, that means that I'm having people open their mouth wide open, take big breaths like that, and do this. And I don't. I absolutely don't. Never. Because I'm, I, don't, uh, I don't think this is good at all. So one of the myths surrounding this is that it's going to cure everything. No, it doesn't cure everything. Um, then it's one exercise. It's a one-size-fits-all exercise. I wouldn't call that a method. 
It's one breathing pattern followed by an exhale followed by a breath hold. Let's talk about the ventilation itself. Breathing through the mouth is really bad for you. So why would I have people ingrain what they tend to already do that they want to learn how to not do that? And if you ask people to systematically breathe through the nose, it's difficult for them. Like right now, when as I'm talking, I don't know if you if you notice, and anybody who will um, pay attention will notice that most of the time when I speak, when you speak, you are exhaling in a vocal manner. My inhale in between those moments when I speak are mostly for the nose. Most people, when they talk, they just breathe through the mouth. You look at, by the way, any of those breath work experts and they systematically breathe through the mouth when they talk. So it's very important to breathe through the nose indeed. It's very important to breathe slowly. It's very important to breathe diaphragmatically. When you are hyperventilating, you're doing the opposite on the three accounts. You breathe through the mouth, you breathe very fast, and you breathe shallow. You don't breathe through the diaphragm. Most people just go like this. So those are the upper respiratory muscles. They are secondary res uh, respiratory muscles. They're not the most important. They fatigue easily. Um, and in typically in people who have respiratory issues, they don't breathe well. They're not happy with their breathing. They, they often feel limited. They often experience anxiety as a result. And you observe their breathing pattern. They breathe with a mouth. They breathe shallow. And they breathe uh, too fast, like 20, 25, 30 times a minute. We're talking about breath cycles, one inhale, one exhale, 25 of them, 30, 30 of them. So you bet that I'm not going to ask people to breathe that way. I'm actually going to teach them how to breathe the way you want them to breathe. It's very simple. Mm. Um. The strengthening of the respiratory muscle is important. If you hyperventilate, but you're going like this, but you're not using the diaphragm, then you're strengthening the wrong muscles. Okay. Um, if you are opening your mouth, then you're teaching your nervous system, hey, opening your mouth is good for you. You know, the brain is smart and at the same time it's also uh very specific in the in the sense that it loves everything reflexive so it will typically in any situation not make you to behave the most efficient way but make you to behave the way you've done the most often in everything if you think a certain way you will in a time of stress you'll think that way if you behave a certain way in a time of stress, you will behave that way, exacerbated. If you breathe a certain way in the time of stress, you will breathe that way, aggravated, etc., etc., etc. So the more you do repetitions of anything, the more you habituate your nervous system to behave that way. You create, not only you create specific neural pathways, but you reinforce them. And you can say, oh, yeah, but it's okay. I'm just doing that exercise now, but then I will change when I need to. No, you won't. Because when you need to change, you will be, there will be a reason why you need to change. That reason will be a concern that occupies your mind so much that you will completely forget how you breathe. So especially the breathing. So when it comes to breathing, a lot of people have been made to believe that CO2 tolerance is the number one reason why they breathe too fast. That is not because of CO2 tolerance. That's because of habit. There's just, there have been circumstances in their life that led them to breathe faster than they should or to breathe through the mouth, or to breathe, to breathe shallow, superficial, not from the diaphragm. It's not because they have a lack of CO2 tolerance. It's because their breathing pattern is a habit. It's maybe the most ingrained habit you'll ever have in your life, which is how you breathe, because you do it 24-7. 24-7 when you never think about it, when you never pay attention to it. So 
whatever are the reasons why you are breathing a certain way today, you could try to track it back. But my point is, if if it's inefficient, you you have to reverse that. There is a way to reverse that. There was a way to retrain the nervous system to breathe better. And you're not going to train the nervous system to breathe better by making it breathe exactly the way it shouldn't be breathing and to make it even worse. It's not necessarily going to teach you how to breathe well. Uh, all right, and then you have the the breathing side, but that's uh, that's uh, also another story. Well, yeah, let's go there next. First of all, that was a really amazing argument um, against the certain style of breathing. And it makes a lot of sense when you're saying if these are our three objectives, this other way of doing things does not fit any of those three. Why would you consciously spend time practicing that for a practice that will be unconscious? It'll it'll adopt those habits. So um, I, I really appreciate that thoughtful response from you. But let's talk about breath holding. Besides Besides catching more fish, if you're a spear fisher, what is the benefit of holding your breath for longer? Well, there are, um, from a physiological perspective, there are many benefits. Number one is that you oxygenate better for multiple reasons. So by the way, when you hyperventilate, uh, some people, and that's another myth that I'm going to use this opportunity to, to debunk for another t- uh, one more time. You're not super oxygenating your tissues when you're hyperventilating. If that was the case, then we all of us would be just breathing really hard whenever we feel that we have some issue breathing and that would solve the problems. It doesn't. It makes more air circulate in your lungs in and out. And yes, it makes more, therefore, a greater volume of oxygen circulate in your bloodstream in relation to time. But that doesn't mean that at a tissue level, your tissues, all your cells in your body that needs oxygen, that doesn't mean that their uptake is going to increase. See, the intake of oxygen is higher, but the uptake is not higher. The intake is how much you get in. It's a little like a, if you were to say the more you eat, the more you are going to use those, uh, you're going to be feeding your body better with all these nutrients because you have tons of them. You have all of them and you eat them like in great quantities every day. No. And why is that? Because that doesn't mean that you will assimilate them. As a matter of fact, you may overwhelm your digestive system so much and your lymphatic system so much that your metabolism is overwhelmed and becomes less efficient. And then you actually, that could cause a problem. So oxygen is in air and oxygen is a little the same. If you breathe more than you should, you're not going to use more oxygen than you need. And only you will not use more oxygen that you can possibly use because your metabolism does not change. The needs the need of your of your cells to use oxygen does not increase just because you breathe more. You also do not store more oxygen in your body just because you breathe more. So all that oxygen that you are inhaling goes back out unused. So not only that, but the problem is when you are inhaling, you are also exhaling. So you are inhaling too much. Then you're exhaling too much, and there's a consequence to that. It's like you're going to deplete your body from CO2. And CO2 is equally important for oxygenation than oxygen itself. CO2 is everywhere in your body. You have, on average, 120 liters of CO2 of carbon elements in your body at any given time. Why is that? 120 liters is a lot. Well, that's because your environment, your, your cellular environment needs that those carbonic elements to regulate the pH of your tissues at a certain level. And when that pH is off, then oxygenation is off. So by breathing more than you should, you are actually deoxygenating. You are getting more oxygen into your body 
but you're getting, getting less oxygen into your cells. That's called the Bohr effect. See, the more you breathe on the outside, the less you breathe in the inside, cellular respiration versus ventilation. And that is why when you do that hyperventilation, a lot of people report symptoms that are hypoxic symptoms. Symptoms of hypoxia, symptoms that their cells are not getting the oxygen they need, like tingling fingers, stiffness in the, in the extremities, a metallic taste in the mouth, tunnel vision. Their brain itself is not properly oxygenated. What does that say? You're not super oxygenating. Um, you're not getting high because you produce natural DMT. That's complete bullshit. And that is causing you a problem. So as for holding your breath, so why is it that then when you hold your breath, you are going to oxygenate better? You're going to oxygenate better because number one, let's say if you had um, a deficit of CO2 in your body, in your tissues because of over breathing, because you breathe too much, you exhale too much of that CO2 that again, you need for proper oxygenation then that's going to help you restore those levels because when you hold your breath, you're going to use some oxygen, that's for sure, but not in ways that um, are going to be any problem to your body because we always have, at, at, at any moment, we have more oxygen circulating in our body than we can possibly use. So you would have to hold your breath for many minutes to finally reach a point where there's a problem with your oxygen levels. So while you're holding your breath, you still have plenty of oxygen. And while you're holding your breath, you're not exhaling. So your metabolism still use that oxygen and still produce CO2. So let's say if you were over breathing, now you are not breathing at all. So you are accumulating CO2 and you're restoring proper pH in all of your tissues. So now all of a sudden you are finally oxygenating properly by not breathing. That's the paradox. You're oxygenating better your cells when you don't breathe for a moment, ideally more than just a few seconds, because during that time you are not exhaling that CO2 that normally you tend to exhale because you breathe in and out all the time way too, too often than you should. So that's the number one reason. And so that's a feel good uh, process right there already is that finally your whole self and including your autonomic nervous system is, is informing your, your, your conscious self, hey, dude, I feel good, sister, whatever. I feel good. I feel good because I don't have to deal with an anxiety of chronically lacking oxygen at a cellular level, not because I don't breathe enough, but because I breathe too much. Two is going to teach you that, hey, it's okay to hold your breath. It's okay to breathe. If you want, when you don't breathe at all for some time. And when you do that repeatedly, you're teaching your nervous system that it's also okay to breathe less. So you're teaching your nervous system to lower its respiratory rate. So instead of breathing 20 breath cycles per minute, now you're going to maybe breathe 12 per minute or less. And that is more effective to learn to breathe slow than to just breathing slow is to literally to not breathe at all consecutively for you know 30 seconds at a time one minute at a time two minutes at a time depending on where you're at depending on what you can handle progressively using your your body to do that and of course um not using but accustoming getting used to all right so what else when you are also holding your breath what happens is that even though you will not really lack oxygen, but you're sending the message to your autonomous nervous system that, hey, you could be lacking oxygen if you keep holding your breath. And because you do that repeatedly, it becomes a pattern. And then the brain, the body is amazing at adjusting and adapting, you know, physiological adaptation, just the same way like if you do bicep curls, 
the bassets will grow because your body will be like, well, every time I have to do that, I'd better be ready. I'm going to grow a stronger, bigger muscle right there so that I can handle that task. Since apparently I have to do it more than once, I have to do it three times a week or something. So if you do that repeatedly with your breath holding, the body will be, and that's through the nervous system, okay? The autonomic nervous system is the body. By the way, the brain is the body as well. So because those are biological tissues, obviously. Valid point. Um, right. And so it will say, if it could think, it would think, hey, I'd be, better be ready for that. So I'd better reinforce all the ways that I can better oxygenate. What are the ways you can better oxygenate? Well, at the lung level, to begin with, lung diffusion, you're going to enlarge the size of your alveoli so that they can diffuse more oxygen and faster. You're going to increase the size of your lungs. So we're talking about alveolar area, the inner surface or inner area that your lungs inside, okay, inside your, your, your lungs are exposed to oxygen you're going to bring more oxygen and faster to your brain and to your heart, so cerebral blood flow. You're going to create smoother, bigger, branchier, if I may say, um, blood, blood vessels to bring more oxygen faster in every area that you know may be in the possibility of being deprived from oxygen that's the way the body responds like hey that's a threat here so let's adapt to better be prepared for the threat you're going to enlarge your spleen the spleen is responsible for holding a reserve of super oxygenated blood not only that but your spleen will also work better at filtering hemoglobin the, the red blood cells because red blood cells have a certain quantity and certain quantity. So you will also produce more red blood cells. And that happens mostly in the bone marrow. It's a system or process called erythropoiesis. It's the production of red blood cells. So when you hold your breath, <clears throat> you will trigger a higher production of red blood cells. And you also filter all the red blood cells that are not in good shape. They will be... Recycled and replace that by new red blood cells that are super efficient at transporting oxygen. So your whole oxygenating system is improved. It's it's pretty amazing. And that's just the physiological aspect of it, because there are also benefits for our mental and emotional self. Quickly, obviously, everybody knows that holding your breath doesn't feel so great. Why? Because it's perceived as a threat. It's not a threat from the outside. It's a threat that's happening inside. So because your autonomic nervous system is so used to keeping you constantly breathing, and it does that autonomically, autonomic nervous system means on its own while you're doing something else, when, you, when, when you're living your life, all of a sudden you're consciously overriding that autonomic nervous system and saying, nope, I'm not inhaling, I'm not exhaling anymore. Well, that's what you do consciously. That's your decision. But the autonomic nervous system, you don't, you don't shut it off. So you may pause the ventilation for some time, but the cellular respiration, the breathing inside doesn't stop. Right. So it wants to keep you breathing. So it's going to try to agitate you, be like, hey, I won't breathe again. It's my job. My job is to make sure that you're right, that you're not doing something stupid, like holding your breath, and that we're going to all stay alive. Okay, it's for your own good. So agitate, agitate, agitate. That's why you feel physically agitated, because you're emotionally agitated, and then you're mentally agitated. So it starts with an emotional agitation. That emotional agitation is already a form of physical agitation, because again, there's no difference. It's the body anyways. All of that is the body. So that emotional agitation is there to protect you, turns into physical agitation, and turns also into mental agitation. All these are three facets of the same process of the nervous system 
disagreeing with the other part of your nervous system, which is your conscious mind and prefrontal cortex making the decision, but the rest of your body is saying, no, 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 we need to regulate this. We need to bring this back to normal. So there's a conflict inside of you when you do that. Now, the great advantage of dealing with that conflict is that you can do two things. One is to have a, a regular reaction, which is like, I hate it, it's horrible, okay, I'll believe again, and I'll never do that again. Or to acknowledge that you are agitated, you are impatient, you are frustrated, you are afraid or you know anxious, and to mentally decide that you're going to stay composed, patient, calm, under that stress. And because you're going to have to do that if you want to hold your breath longer, or if you want to hold your breath not longer, but every time better, which more relaxation, more relaxation, more relaxation. So what you're going to teach yourself by doing that is not CO2 tolerance, it's tolerance. Tolerance of the stress that you and you alone create and you and you alone handle. So any of your reaction that happens within you is on you. Now the question is, is not, oh, what happens to your mind when you do that? That is not the proper question. The proper question is, what does your mind want to make happen to itself? That is the question. So when you repeat that challenge, when you repeat that practice of down regulation of calming the mind, of becoming patient when you have all the reasons to be impatient, of becoming confident when you have all the reasons to be adapting yourself, of remaining composed when you have all the reasons to become agitated, when you don't fuel that negative response, but instead you intentionally fuel the response you want then you start to master your inner experience. And it's not just something that happens in the moment because everything we do, that we do when we're engaged, deliberate, mindful, that we do with enough consistency, we create specific pathways. That's neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain, of our cerebral matter to alter itself in the way it desires and the way that it is beneficial to, to it, at least the positive neuroplasticity. We induce that plasticity, which we create new neural pathways, or then we reinforce them. And what are those neural pathways? What are the new neural pathways that enable you to stay calm, to stay patient, to stay confident, to not buy into the factory settings, which are, oh, there's a threat, therefore, oh, my God, oh, my God, what's going on? I can't handle it. Well, you know, anyone can agitate themselves. To be upset, to be edgy, to be cranky, whatever you call that, that's not a skill. <laughs> that's something everyone can do just like that. Is the reverse that is the challenge for most people. I don't know how to calm my mind. I don't know how to calm myself. I don't know how to tranquilize. So they want a pill. They want somebody to soothe them. They want a show to numb them. They want something external to help them handle what they cannot handle on their own because that skill I'm talking about just like anything else, must be practiced. If you don't ever practice calm, tranquility, emotional resilience, how will you ever have any? Maybe it's in your nature, but in most people, it's not. So how does the mind practice itself so that it can have the experience of itself that it wants when it wants it, and especially when it's challenging, because everybody can be cool when everything is fine, of course, it's when you are confronting, you know, facing challenges, stress, something from outside of you, 
And also sometimes literally you have your own triggers inside, like nobody's talking to you, nobody's doing anything to you and you trigger yourself inside and that's it. You're upset, you're, you're mad, you're um, uh, anxious, all kind of unpleasant aspects of the experience that we are. We all are that experience within. That experience is unique to ourselves. We do not share it with anyone. What is it? And most importantly, what do you make it to be? That is the question. So if you're asking me about the physiological uh, benefits of breath holding, benefits for your health, well, I've described them. Beyond all these little details, it's all about one thing, oxygenation, tissue oxygenation. And we know it's been proven by science many times that a lack of tissue oxygenation is um, a cause for many, many, many other health issues. So if you don't oxygenate properly at a tissue level, you can't be healthy. And breathing more is not going to make you oxygenate better. Except if you have a very, very poor breathing function. But that's only typically like people who smoke a lot or people who are really old. And from the mental perspective, well, then it's, uh, again, it's practicing. Um, okay, I'm going to use a literally an alchemical metaphor. It's turning your lead into gold. The lead is all the thoughts, all the responses of your mind, your emotions that are unpleasant and negative and that easily comes out of, of you by default to transmute that lead into the opposite that everybody secretly or not desire to, be, to feel good, to be calm, to be patient to be composed, to be compassionate, to be grateful, to be graceful. Everyone wishes they were like that. Now, how, if you're not like that, how do you become that? Do you believe you can become like that? You can be, make yourself to become more and more like that. Won't make, maybe it won't make you perfect, of course, all right? But you can make yourself better. You can improve who you are. And to improve who you are starts with improving the experience that you are. To experience, to improve the experience that you are, you have not only to believe that you can achieve it, you also have to get to work in a specific way. And you can call that philosophy or psychology or spirituality. Does it matter how you call it? It doesn't. But if it is what you wish, if you are tired of aspects of your responses, aspects of your inner conduct, inner behaviors, inner thoughts, inner thinking world, if the, the world that you are within, the experience that you are within, not the one that you show outside with a smile, are you okay? Yes, I'm okay, but you're not. If that part, if you're not happy with it, through your dedicated intention and practice, you can you can do amazing. But you gotta you gotta put down the work, and you have to also know how to do it because that's not not necessarily clear for for most people. Yeah, Erwin, I am so riveted. That was one of the fastest hours. I've ever experienced in my life. That was absolutely <laughs> I spoke too much. Wonderful. No, it was amazing. And I'm so, so grateful that you have helped develop a system that can help people to get those results. And you've got that available. I, I yeah, I'm blown away by this conversation. This was absolutely wonderful. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you in your work and find your course? So that would be a breath hold work. So breath like breath and hold like hold and work like work. It's a practice of holding one's breath, but in a way that is very intentional and very beneficial um, and absolutely safe, by the way. It's very progressive, very gentle. 
Um, and uh, I teach it uh, through online live programs. Right now, I have a group of 40 people that uh, train with me uh, twice a, a week for four weeks. 40 people are doing this at the moment. And otherwise, uh, people learn at their own pace through my e-course, which is the Breathful Work Meditation Masterclass, where I share with them through dozens and dozens of videos, hours and hours of, of education, the the why and the how, you know, the insights and the, the diverse exercises, exercises of breathing, exercises of breath holding, exercises of meditation, visualization, affirmation. It's, it's, uh, I blend a lot of, uh, I line up a, a lot of dots for people to connect and they get amazing results. Well, following you over the years with all your work with MoveNet, I know that your content with Breathwork is going to be absolutely wonderful. I've come to expect that from you. Erwin LaCour, thank you so very much for thank taking you. the time to come back on our show today. It was such an honor and it's such an engaging conversation. I think people will be listening to that more than once. So thank you so very much for taking the time to come on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. So very quickly here, as soon as I got off the line with Erwan, he mentioned that he has a discount code that he generated specifically for our listeners, which is fantastic. So I wanted to make sure you knew about it. The discount code is BOUNDLESS25. BOUNDLESS is spelled all caps, um, B-O-U-N-D-L-E-S-S, -S, obviously with a 2-5 afterwards. That is 25% off if you are looking to uh, explore his course, Breath Hold Work Meditation Masterclass. His content is absolutely amazing, and you heard from this interview how smart he is. So I hope you take advantage of that discount code, which is again, in all caps, BOUNDLESS25. As always, thank you so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio. I know I say this all the time, but I really do mean it. It has been such a joy to make and produce this podcast and to watch it grow. Our business started in the pandemic in July of 2020, and we started the podcast in October of 2020. So it has been three years now, and to see that we have generated over 400,000 downloads worldwide is just simply unbelievable to me. This year in particular has been such a blast to travel to different health conferences and not only meet some of our amazing guests, but also to meet many of you, our listeners and supporters. We really just can't thank you enough. As always, feel free to book a complimentary 30-minute session on our website, which is myboundlessbody.com. On our homepage, there is a book now button where you can find a time to speak with us about health, fitness, nutrition, whatever you like. We've loved chatting with people all over the world and many of you out there to bounce ideas off each other or to try to come up with plans to achieve specific goals. Or even if it's just to reach out to introduce yourselves, we would just love to meet you and connect with you there. Also, be sure to check out our YouTube channel if you'd like to watch these full interviews and also the shorter interviews on more specific topics that are taken from these full interviews. We've gotten really good feedback over there. It's also a really fun way to interact with people who comment. We read and reply to every single YouTube comment we get. So head on over there if you want to start a conversation and watch these um, videos. As always, if you haven't already, please leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple. It really is the best way to make sure this podcast gets out there to more listeners. We've been able to keep Boundless Body Radio ad-free for three years and really want to continue to do so. And so your five-star ratings and reviews are the best way to support us at Boundless Body and support the podcast. Cheers. Thank you again so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio.